Is liberty dying where you live? Escape to Keen at freekeen.com. So let's bring up Stephanie Murphy from Let's Talk Bitcoin and Free Talk Live. And she was the host of this very same panel last year, did an awesome job. And she's like, Ms. Bitcoin, so why not uh, have her back to do it all over again? Except this time with a, a different panel of distinguished and a very large panel of distinguished guests, which I'm sure you will introduce. Uh, welcome back to Keenvention, Steph. Thank you so much, Ian. It's great to be back. I'm really excited that we're doing this panel again. We've uh, rotated the guests, so uh, hopefully we'll get the maximum bang for your Bitcoin here. Uh, <laughs> I'm Stephanie Murphy. I am the host of uh, the podcast called Let's Talk Bitcoin. It comes out twice a week, and it's all about Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies and beyond. And you can find it at letstalkbitcoin.com. And I've got with me five gentlemen. You know, I when I was trying to plan out this panel, I did didn't think this many people would say yes. I kind of asked. <laughs> I kind of asked a bunch of people, thinking like, "Oh, they're going to turn me down. They turned me down last year. I'm going to get rejected. It's going to hurt." Uh, so I'll just put out my feelers and ask as many people <laughs> as I can. And uh, lo and behold, uh, these five fine gentlemen did say yes. So thank you guys for for being on the panel. I'm actually really excited to have all of you here because I think all of you have something really cool to say about Bitcoin and uh, specifically how it ties in with New Hampshire and and freedom. So. So uh, we've got Daryl W. Perry. He is the uh, proprietor of FPP.cc, the uh, free press publications. He, uh, he does all kinds of stuff, publishes a newspaper, is a book publisher, independent book publisher, uh, accepts Bitcoin at his business. So that makes him a Bitcoin entrepreneur as well. Daryl, did I get all that right? Yes, you did. Okay, thank you. And uh, Brian Sovereign. Brian is the host of the technology podcast Sovereign Tech. He uh, was here in New Hampshire from the beginnings of the Bitcoin uh, revolution, <laughs> Bitcoin movement, and he's very knowledgeable about technology, security, has some interesting criticisms of Bitcoin 2.0 uh, technologies, which we'll get into perhaps here on the panel, uh, that I think he's becoming well known for. Brian, thank you for being here. Did I get everything right, too? <laughs> I yeah, that have. works, uh, though you didn't call me the Golden Stallion. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, we'll, uh, we'll have to talk about that later. Is that because of the uh, FISA court letter? <laughs> no, I, I'm safe. Hashtag I have not been contacted canary. by the government yet. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> uh, we've also got Riaz Kahan. He is a the Agoras Taxi <laughs> here in New Hampshire. I think you've already been outed as the Agoras Taxi uh, that works for Bitcoin, uh, giving people rides. <laughs> <laughs> better than Uber, perhaps treats their employees a little bit be better, doesn't support the police or the military like Uber does. And, uh, <laughs> and you also have uh, also had your part in organizing the Bitcoin meetups in Manchester, New Hampshire. So did I get all that right for you, Riaz? Yep, it's all correct. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for your service, by the way, I have to say, <laughs> driving that taxi. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks. Working the Happy streets. customer right here. <laughs> we've already got a customer testimonial. So next we've got Josh Harvey. He is uh, one of the co-founders of Lamasu, which is a company that makes a Bitcoin machine. It's not exactly an ATM because it doesn't go both ways or uh, you can't really take cash out of it, but you can feed in your worthless fiats and get valuable Bitcoins out the other side right onto your phone. And uh, created that with um, his brother, um, uh, Zach and Matt Whitlock, I think, was also the co-founder of Lamasu. He's since left, but you guys started that company and since then have gone global, and now they are our Lamasu ATMs, our vending machines, Lamasu machines all over the world. Um, you also took your machine to Porkfest, the Porcupine Freedom Festival, and somehow, in the middle of the woods with no internet, served the pork fest community with bitcoins 24 7 <laughs> with this machine and it was very handy there i used it too so josh and zach welcome to uh welcome to the panel thank you for being here thanks a lot stephanie yes and uh, zach I, di I guess i didn't really introduce you uh individually but y of course you're an individual you deserve your own introduction <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's all right it's all right i'm sure you guys get that a lot like yeah. people kind of consider you like one entity i i will try to avoid doing that I, you are both individual people and collectivist <laughs> <laughs> you each have something cool to say so uh so thank you that's uh that's our introduction here for the panelists and you know just a few words before we start Bitcoin in New Hampshire has been just so exciting. To it, I've been here from the beginning, and I just remember ever since Gavin Andreessen um, took 
Ian and Mark from Free Talk Live out to lunch back in 2011, was it? Some, sometime around there, uh, many years ago, and told them about this new nerdy project that he was working on. Uh, it's called Bitcoin, and it's a way to have these tokens that you can transfer around online and send money, value, anywhere in the world. Um, and the idea really caught on with them, and they started to talk about it on Free Talk Live. Bitcoin just took hold in this community of people who came to New Hampshire because they're interested in freedom. And it was so cool. It was really a natural fit with libertarians because, you know, I think all of us maybe have experienced a little bit of the financial oppression, you know, the war on cash that's happening. Uh, no, the government doesn't want you to be able to do transactions with financial privacy. They want to know every little bit that you spend and where you spend it and who you got it from so they can tax and track and control you. And uh, I think a lot of the people who moved to New Hampshire to get more freedom in their lives don't want to be, be subject to that kind of control. So Bitcoin was really uh, a natural fit. It's also not, not war dollars. You know, it's not a currency that's used to fund uh, threat, coercion, and theft around the world, a destruction of people's property. Um, and that is appealing to libertarians too. So with that in introduction in mind, I would like everybody to just kind of talk a little bit about their business or project and how Bitcoin fits in with that. Like tell me some stories and anecdotes about how you use Bitcoin in your work or how you first found out about it. I just want to hear like an, like an interesting story from each person. Let's start with Daryl. So I think it was about uh, 2009 when I first heard about Bitcoin. That's pretty early. You it was like, early. Did you know Satoshi? Were uh, you in with no, Satoshi? No, no, I, I did not. But the weird thing is, I was involved in the Ron Paul presidential campaign in 08. I was one of the precinct coordinators and, you know, some other stuff. So I, I was a, you know, hard money guy. And at the CPAC in 2009, I was having a discussion with somebody and this guy was saying, well, yeah, I agree that, you know, like we need to get rid of the Fed, but we can replace it with having the Treasury just issue like, you know, digits and then, you know, like a completely digital currency that the Fed controls and they can just inflate and they don't have to worry about firing up a printer and this and that. And I was like, that's a horrible idea. <laughs> and it was several months later when I first heard about this cryptocurrency thing called Bitcoin. And I was like, ah, this is that thing where they can just like add money and hyperinflation in a snap of a finger. No, that was Fedcoin. And he, he was suggesting Fedcoin. Right. But <laughs> it, it took me a, about a year and a half to realize that, you know, Bitcoin isn't this horrible thing that I thought it was, you know, it's decentralized. And I kept asking people, you know, like how, what keeps it from just being inflated, you know, on somebody's whim? And they're like, because of the coding. And I was like, okay, but you're saying it's open source. That means people can change the coding. And they're like, but the coding. And I'm like, something doesn't register here. And then ultimately somebody was like, okay, so parts of the coding can be changed, but the core of the coding can't be. And I was like, Okay, and by that time, Bitcoin was at like, you know, $5, and somebody said, I want to send you some Bitcoin. And I was like, don't really trust it, but okay. And so they sent me eight of them, and then I sold them immediately. And then a oh. few months later, the same thing happened where somebody sent me like, you know, five Bitcoin that was worth $40, and I sold them immediately. And I wish I would have kept those first 13 Bitcoin that I received in those two transactions. Uh, so that, that was sort of my introduction, and I really started buying Bitcoin at the 2013 Liberty Forum, uh, thanks in part to a little machine prototype that the two guys down at the end had. Because originally, the first time that Bitcoin hit $30 and then it almost immediately went back to 10 I was like, okay, well, maybe if it starts going up a little bit, I don't know, maybe... And then it started going up, and I was like, I'll buy when it hits 10, and then it hit 30, and I was like, I'll buy when it hits 10, and uh, screw it, I'll just go ahead and buy, and then it's not seen $10 again since. You know, I remember saying the same thing myself. I was at the, uh, at the 2013 Liberty Forum. I remember walking out of a movie theater 
and seeing this seeing the silver circle premiere of that movie and roger ver was there and he excitedly like walked over to me and he goes bitcoin's at an all-time high it's 33 dollars <laughs> and the thinking about it now back at 33 dollars today it's 300 something dollars <laughs> it's 10 times that and we've seen highs of uh, 1200 so um that was really like a little cool piece of history there. So you were skeptical at first, but eventually you uh, you got on board. Brian, how about you? How did you first find out about Bitcoin? And what are your your Bitcoin regret stories, if you have any, about selling it early or whatever? <laughs> I think you have one of those stories. Oh, boy. Yeah, I, I probably have some regrets. Uh, as to the first time that I wasn't skeptical about it at all, but there's a kind of a funny reason why uh, when I first heard about it. And I think I first heard about it on Free Talk Live, but I may have heard rumors of it a little bit before so like it wasn't so odd when it when it just you know came to my ears uh, through a podcast uh, because I, I've been involved in the cypherpunk community for for quite some time so you know you hear things on forums and all this about these kind of technologies um, but at the time in 2011 when I had heard it uh, I was still calling myself not to say that I felt that way inside but I was still calling myself a Christian and this was on my kind of my path to some serious liberty and uh, as soon as I heard about this, and I went and I talked to my family and some other people about it, uh, I said, I was like, well, you know, there's this, this currency, this could really be like this one world currency, and then suddenly everybody's, <gasps> a one world currency. So the you book thought of Revelation, you know, and so as soon as I heard, I, you know, I mean, because that's, that's what the book of Revelation says, that there would be a one world economy, not, not a one world government. It never says that, but it says there'd be an economy. And so as soon as I heard that, this was like a problem for Christians. So like, this has got to be great. I need this. I need this right now. But... <laughs> Uh, but n no offense to any Christians um, <laughs> in the audience. Um, but that, that was why I was so sure. I was like, wow, this is a great technology because I was feeling very rebellious at the time. Uh, but all the same, uh, it was very exciting when I read about it. Uh, there was a great book by Peter Ludlow uh, called uh, Cyber States and Pirate Utopias that came out in 2001, which described quite a bit uh, of what Bitcoin would eventually be. In fact, I half wonder at times if Peter Ludlow himself isn't Satoshi Nakamoto. Uh, but uh, it's a, a fantastic book, really, you know, t to see it all kind of come and start coming into fruition was really exciting uh, for me. And uh, I actually, boy, I, I started mining it. I was working at a tech company at the time that did uh, point of sale systems. And with, we had to burn in what they called burning in the registers, which was making sure, giving them an overnight test, you know, running the RAM hard and the CPU hard and whatever. And so instead of actually running the normal test that, I, that we were supposed to do on these uh, registers, <laughs> I'd line up, you know, 10, 15 of these registers and just plug in a bunch of USB drives with mining software on them. And, uh, you know, got, got quite a few Bitcoin out of that, but unfortunately I sold out of those... God, 2012. I mean, you were <laughs> really proud that early. you sold them at four dollars, yeah, right? <laughs> yeah, what a mistake uh, that that was. But uh, you know, that that's how it goes. Uh, but now, I mean, I'm an ad exec for Free Talk Live, uh, which is very exciting, and getting to work with the few Bitcoin companies, present company accepted, of course, you know, that are that are willing uh, to actually uh, realize how important it is to get your get the Bitcoin message out there, even when it costs some money, uh, has been a real pleasure, you know, to work with them. And uh, they've generally been very up and up people. So, Brian, you went from thinking it was the mark of the beast to... Uh, well, that's what excited me about it. <laughs> <laughs> you liked, you wanted the mark of the beast. All right. <laughs> so, Riaz, how did you, how did you find out about... What's your story with the, with the Agorist Cab Company? How did you start doing that for Bitcoin? I mean, uh, the, the market for rides in New Hampshire, there's got to be one there, but it's not big enough for Uber or Lyft really to come in. So, how did you get into this? Um, okay, uh, I guess it all started in 2012. I was a big Ron Paul supporter for years. Um, I was always uh, pretty passionate about ending the Fed and auditing the Fed and all those different things. And uh, I remember in December of 2012, I was listening to Free Talk Live. So it's, uh, it's another common uh, place where people find out about Bitcoin. It was definitely the, the case for me. Um, Heard Mark Edge talking about it incessantly for weeks, if not months, and finally got on the bandwagon around Liberty Forum of 2013, um, like maybe 15 or $20 per Bitcoin. Um, and then I moved here to the Free State Project in uh, September of last year, and um, in about 
around December, I just started giving rides to people. I just realized there's a lot of the community in Manchester that don't have vehicles. Uh, and I think Amanda Billyrock was my first customer, and she offered to pay me some Bitcoin. And I didn't really think anything of it. I have a Prius. It only cost me, I don't know, 50 cents to do a ride in gas. Uh, so she started paying me in Bitcoin 5 to $10. And after, the, after a couple of days, the uh, word spread around that I was doing rides for Bitcoin. I, d I had nothing to do with it. It just kind of spread around. And next thing I know, my phone started blowing up every day. And now I've given <laughs> rides to about 120 different ports. Clearly a dangerous terrorist, uh, <laughs> if I ever s saw one. <laughs> cool. All right. So, and we'll talk about, I guess, the Bitcoin meetups. But first, I want to hear from Josh and then Zach about, you know, the, the beginnings of Lamasu and, like, how long were you into Bitcoin before you decided, mm, I think we can uh, start a company here and do a service? Yeah, actually, the uh, Bitcoin meetups were a big part of uh, Lama Su. Um, when I found out about Bitcoin, it, it's a bit of a haze. Uh, it was probably around 2010. I just remember um, somehow finding the Bitcoin Project page, and it was a very small page at that point, on the internet. Um, my first reaction was... Uh, you know, this is too weird. I wasn't that excited about it. And then uh, I remember uh, somebody on Facebook um, a few months later, just one of my Facebook friends, um, libertarian guy, and I was in Israel at that point. Um, he, he just posted on his wall, wow, Bitcoin's worth 25 cents. And I couldn't believe it because I didn't even, it didn't have a market value really when I had first looked into it. And that's when I started taking it seriously. Um, and you know what happens when you first learn about Bitcoin and, and get excited about it, you just don't eat or sleep for the next two weeks. Yep. And uh, <laughs> that was pretty much me reading the white paper, um, trying to figure out what was going on here. And um, then it got very exciting. The price started going crazy. Um, At the time when you first found out about it, were there, were there any exchanges? Was Mt. Gox up yet? Um, let's see, it was, it was worth about 25 cents. I think that was pre-Mt. Gox at that point, or Wow. The very, very beginnings. Um, I couldn't get it. My first Bitcoin, I, I was trying to figure out who would sell me some Bitcoins, and there was the Web of Trust. Uh, that was the best way to get at that point, but I wasn't on the Web of Trust. So I, I somehow convinced this uh, guy in New Zealand to, uh, to take my, you know, um, 12 bucks of PayPal money, <laughs> and, uh, and he sent me some Bitcoins. Um, but fast forward to... Um, moved to New Hampshire in uh, the beginning of 2012 or the end of 2011. And um, it was really the 2012 Pork Fest. Um, it was the first Pork Fest that I went to, and there was a bunch of Bitcoin activity going on there. And um, Eric Voorhees was there. A lot of the uh, BitInstant guys were there. And that's when we kind of had this idea to start a Bitcoin meetup in New Hampshire. Right after Pork Fest, we started Bitcoin meetup. It's been going on every week since then. Um, I think it's maybe the longest running Bitcoin meetup yeah. in the country or, or maybe in the even world, in the world. Probably, yes. Um, yeah. there, there, wasn't, there wasn't a lot going on um, back in those days. And one of the things we started talking about those meetups is, uh, hey, what can we do? What does Bitcoin need? We decided uh, it had to be easier to for the average person to get themselves some Bitcoin. And that's when we started fooling around with the, uh, the Bitcoin ATM idea. And at the same time, we were traveling around to all these uh, different libertarian conferences like Students for Liberty all around the area. We went to New York, Boston, Philadelphia. Um, we put on some Bitcoin, uh, Bitcoin conference in Philadelphia. So we did a bunch of stuff like that. A few of us were going around. And it was actually at the Students for Liberty uh, conference it was their global conference in Washington, D.C., where we first showed off our uh, little wooden pro prototype Bitcoin machine. And this is like January 2013? This was February 2013, yeah. Yep, okay. And the week after that was, uh, was Liberty Forum. And that's when it really blew up. CNET was there. They did a, an article on us. And um, the rest is uh, pretty much history from there. So it's, it really ties into to Pork Fest, Liberty Forum, uh, the New Hampshire Bitcoin community, um, in, in a very, very real sense, that's where the Bitcoin, uh, the idea of the Bitcoin ATM, the Bitcoin machine really got its start. 
So a real startup uh, outside of the comfort of Silicon Valley. You guys were really intimately tied with um, the Free State Project and Liberty. That's cool. So Zach, maybe you could tell the story of getting ready for that 2013 Liberty Forum. Like I know you guys had some crazy times. You were you were kind of hauling this machine around. It was a little bit uh, rough around the edges. It was not, nuts and bolts were sticking out in different places. You guys had been up all night trying to get it ready. <laughs> yeah. And this was when the Bitcoin price was on the move from eh, hovering around... Thirteen, ten dollars up to about thirty, and it's right. never seen the light of ten dollars again. So, so tell me what that was like. Well, it was crazy. I mean, for one, it. it uh, I think the hardest part was getting it ready for the the conference right before Liberty Forum, which is this the international, maybe even the first international students for liberty uh, convention in in Washington D.C. Uh, of course. Um, and for us, I mean, this wasn't kind of like, okay, guys, how do we start this business? It was just a project of, hey, there's this, you know, machine we want to try to get together and show off because it's really awesome. Look, you put money in and you get Bitcoin. I mean, paper money. Um, and, but part of it is that, you know, we didn't really have um, s specific roles or, or, or really a timeline for this. It was more of a like, oh no, this is happening like in two days. What do we do? <laughs> um, we don't have anything. And so we, for the last two, three days, we were working like crazy. I mean, um, I think Matt was soldering uh, like some things to the, the PC bo B PCB board like about an hour and a half before the flight. And we had to just like grab him. <laughs> and I remember like we, we'd locked the, we actually were doing this all in, um, in the old, we had a guitar store in, in Manch for about eight months. And so we had already decided to close that down, and but we were using that store for, for putting all the pieces together because we couldn't really do it in the apartments. Wow. Um, I remember you guys were selling guitar stuff for Bitcoin, yeah, right? Really right. early we on. We were one of BitPay's first customers, I think. Wow. We, uh, Fascinating. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, you know, so I, I remember kind of like finally getting everything, it, you know, we weren't, first of all, it didn't work yet. Um, and then the graphics, we, you know, we were just trying to like, we had like a sticker that we worked on and, uh, and we were just kind of like trying to get that. I don't even know if we, we put it on. We just didn't have any time in the flight. You know, we had to leave for the flight. And I remember picking up all the pieces and going out and knowing that if we forgot any of the pieces, it just wouldn't work because, you know, it's just a, a part you had to order from eBay. And so I remember we closed the door and then I'm like, let me just check one more time. And I went in and there was, you know, like one of the small adapters or something ah. and I found it. So, you know, it's, it's those little things. And then we uh, rushed to the flight, made the flight. Um, you know, and, and in, in a way you're like, phew, we made it. And then you remember that nothing works yet. Um, <laughs> and, that's, and, and so we got to the, uh, the hotel room in Washington, D.C., maybe got something to eat. And well, then how did you get it through the TSA? Um, actually, we, we, had a, um, we checked it. Okay. In pieces, I think. Is the right, answer. in pieces. <laughs> right. Okay. So, so one guy took the screen, another guy took the, uh, the bill acceptor, and then there was just like a wooden box. You know, I think you're allowed to bring a wooden box. I mean, it was pretty small. Um, but it was definitely in pieces. And then um, basically we're up, uh, um, I guess, all night trying to get the, uh, the last kinks of uh, software. Um, and so the first night we didn't have it ready. And then like the first day I went downstairs to kind of try to explain people, you know, and, and hype things up a bit, which of course created more pressure for, for Josh and Matt <laughs> to work on the programming. And then at like 11 a.m. it's like I got like a Eureka message. Um, and, and then we had to all bring it down and like we all had to hold a little part because if any of the wires would come out, of course, it wouldn't work. Um, and then we got it down. We actually got it working. And I, I mean, we haven't even, at this point, we hadn't even used it. Um, then how did you know it worked? We didn't. Um, <laughs> we knew that the software was, was you know. <laughs> right. And uh, then we did one test run, and we're like, wow, this is easy. And then within 10 minutes, it was already like all over Twitter and everything. And uh, so people were getting really excited about that. So, um, so these people at the Students for Liberty conference knew what Bitcoin was, and they wanted to yeah, buy it? Yeah. Wow. I mean, the amazing thing is some of those guys at that point were already like some of these 18 to 21-year-old guys were already talking about how they're Bitcoin millionaires. <laughs> and, wow. And that was... That was when it was like 10 bucks? That was when it was going up to 30, and they're like, oh my God, I have so much money. They're on an island somewhere now, right. so. Yeah, so there are <laughs> a lot of rich them. libertarians out there. That's, that's the good news. Um, 
And then a week later, it was it was Liberty Form. So, we, you know, it was a little bit more relaxed. We already knew we got it working once. Wow. Um, and then, uh, you know, right after that, we said, okay, you know, people are getting excited about this little orange box. And then that's when we started working on a on kind of like a real model, a production model. Wow. And that's another crazy story. Very <laughs> cool. Well, I, I really appreciate hearing about that. It's a quite a nail biter, you know, getting that ready. But uh, you guys made history, so g- kudos to you. Uh, I want to ask you, Brian, specifically, uh, I know you've talked before about uh, how New Hampshire has really the potential to be like, the n- not Silicon Valley, but like maybe Milliard Valley or something like that. And maybe, <laughs> maybe uh, Josh, you came up with that phrase, I'm not sure, but uh, <laughs> there really does seem to be a hub of early Bitcoin adopters and Bitcoin activity and Bitcoin businesses in New Hampshire. And I just want to know, like, do you think New Hampshire could be the next Silicon Valley? And what would need to happen for that to occur? Well, th- there's been a lot of write-ups uh, recently, uh, particularly coming from some luminaries like Tim Draper and others, that pretty much Silicon Valley itself only has a good two years left, that it's in a pretty serious bubble, and that actually anywhere where Bitcoin is really taking hold could be the next Silicon Valley. Um, and Bitcoin's abilities, or at least blockchain technology's abilities, seems pretty limitless uh, you know, your imagination's, uh, you know, is the ceiling. And with that, I mean, if you could create a, an area like New Hampshire, you know, and it could be anywhere in New Hampshire, it could be Keene, you take your pick, uh, where those businesses could thrive, uh, you know, you, you really, you have a, a pretty golden opportunity uh, to be the center of the world, much like Silicon Valley is. Because, and I agree with the assessment that Silicon Valley really is going to fall apart pretty fast because there's no innovation coming out of there whatsoever. Uh, as to where I think there's plenty of, uh, you know, really bright guys right here in New Hampshire that could definitely take advantage uh, of, uh, you know, of this lack of, of innovation. Yeah, we got a real uh, talent hub here that I'm, I'm uh, you know, I don't want to say I'm proud to be from New Hampshire or like I'm proud of it because I had nothing to do with it, but it's cool to live in a place where there's so many uh, Bitcoin experts i guess and and with bitcoin you don't have to ask for permission just do your business yeah you know? i mean and you have a huge community here that will back you up when you take the risk and that's that's really the beauty of new hampshire is the community that you have to uh, you know to let you do what you have to do again without asking permission just start your business and make it happen yeah so speaking of which uh that's a perfect segue into what i wanted to ask you riaz um have you had any trouble from the authorities uh with your taxi business i mean you really couldn't get a job with uber or lyft even if you wanted to because they don't serve this area they don't consider it important enough right now um you are basically just starting your own independent business have you had any trouble from the from the police or any issues that you want to talk about um, one of the most unique things about my business is, uh, and this is the mo- one of the most beautiful things about it, is that uh, my clientele is literally only porks. So it's exclusively just people I'm, I'm actually friends with, pretty much, for the most part. Um, living in Manchester, where there's so many social activities every day, uh, it's pretty easy to meet 300 porcupines w- within a few months uh, that, that, I, that I lived here at that point. And for and people who may be listening on the internet, a porcupine is like a nickname for a, free, a person who moved to New Hampshire to get more liberty. Collectivist. <laughs> <laughs> Quiet. <laughs> exactly. Um, so uh, my clientele are all people I know. So it, uh, it, it's pretty exclusive. Uh, it's not marketed uh, toward the greater commu- the greater public or the, the populace of the city. Um, so you don't need to expand out with your business model. You've got enough business just from basically giving friends rides. Exactly. Yeah. And there, there was there's no marketing needed. It was all word of mouth that just spread organically through Facebook and uh, in-person social activities that happen frequently in Manchester. You got some news coverage though, didn't you? You got like local news coverage and I don't know, I'm always seeing like every time I go to an airport outside of New Hampshire uh, and I request a Uber ride or something like that, they'll say stuff like, well, meet me on the third level because the first level, that's their territory, the taxis <laughs> and the, the cops wait, wait there for us and they don't like it. So, uh, I mean, you have had some media exposure. How did that go? Yeah, actually, uh, at Liberty Forum uh, of this year, um, I, I was I was doing a lot of rides for directly for the Free State Project for their events. Uh, one of which is Liberty Forum, which uh, brings uh, several hundred people 
to, well, this year it'll be Manchester, New Hampshire in a convention format similar to this one, uh, similar to Key Invention, but on a larger scale. And I was doing a lot of rides. That was a very busy period for the week. And I was doing rides for a lot of the guest speakers, um, one of which was Kashmir Hill, who's a, re a reporter or a writer for uh, Forbes.com. And she went ahead and included a couple paragraphs about me in an article about the Free State Project. And, and she has uh, written about living on Bitcoin. She's written a lot about Bitcoin in Forbes, so you're probably familiar with her stuff if you're listening to this. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Thankfully, for some reason, I haven't had any trouble with the authorities, even though my Facebook is public. I have a Facebook-like page for AgriCab. Um, Uber has entered the market recently in, in New Hampshire just in the last week. They're, they're expanding oh. on a very slow... Kind of, it, it's it, they're just kind of picking up at this point in the uh, very early stages, and they said that there's actually no laws that they're breaking with their operations here, so I'm not sure. That kind of gives me the green light to expand to the greater population now and start marketing outside of the community. So, here's a question: Do you want to join Uber, or <laughs> would you rather keep working for yourself? And I mean, Uber doesn't accept Bitcoin, right? So exactly, there's there's a lot of. Um, there's a lot of ways to compete with Uber and still have an edge on them, considering they don't accept cash in any aspect. They don't accept Bitcoin. Uh, they report all the income to the IRS and things like that. And Our audience does not like this. <laughs> <laughs> so some of my aspirations uh, for the future include maybe competing directly with Uber and creating an app and literally just going head to head with them at some point. Wow, that's cool. All right. Well, we wish you good luck providing voluntary services to people in a peaceful manner. Love it. Uh, Daryl, how do you see Bitcoin uh, helping with independent publishers? Because I know there's a, lot of, there's a lot of issues that maybe motivated you to get into independent publishing in the first place. Right. So uh, with the you know, quote-unquote mainstream publishers or, you know, Actually, I, I would say probably a good many of the uh, libertarian publishing companies there. There actually are like you know one or two others that exist. They still abide by copyright laws, and they want you to sign over the copyright to them. And I don't really believe in the current copyright laws as they exist. I, I think they're totally flawed, and I don't want to have to you know like sign over my rights to somebody else, especially when I want to put the stuff out under a, uh, a Creative Commons license or a Copy Heart license. So, you know, like, I, I don't want to submit my stuff to Penguin Press or Random House or whoever, and then, you know, one, probably get a rejection letter, and two, them say, okay, well, we want the copyright. And I'm like, uh, no, screw you. So it, it was mainly the copyright issue that caused me to you know, look into how, how to do this independent publishing thing. And there's another issue, and you know, right now there's not really a way to get around this if you want you know, like Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and Books A Million to carry your stuff, and that is the International Standard Book Number called an ISBN, that every book published that is carried on Amazon unless it's something that was, you know, printed before the creation thereof, uh, you know, before the creation of the ISBN, not before the creation of Amazon. Uh, Amazon will not carry a book that does not have an ISBN, unless you somehow jump through all of their hoops and hurdles to become your own distributor, and, you know, that's a pain in the ass to even begin the process. So I, I found a company that is actually a subsidiary of Amazon. So I've got this weird love-hate relationship with Amazon. Uh, and the cost of a single ISBN from Bowker, which is the only company in the United States that you can buy an ISBN number from, cost $125. If you want to buy more than that, you can buy 10 of them for $250. You can buy 100 of them for $600, 1,000 for $1,000, and then it goes down from there. So it's one of these things where it's, you know, like you save money if you buy in bulk, but it doesn't cost them any extra money because, you know, they just have some weird random computer thing that generates the number. So it doesn't cost them extra money to, like, just send you one. But they want to, you know, charge you 
an exorbitant fee. And I would love to see some sort of blockchain technology be able to be used to replace the ISBN. And I'm sure to completely do away with that, there's all kinds of international treaties that would have to be done away with to you know get wide adopted or widespread acceptance. But I, I think that it's something that it has potential, and I don't know how to do it. So if there's anybody that knows how to like you know create a blockchain sort of thing, I'll throw my idea out there. Uh, I, I want to sort of take from the best of various cryptos, NXT being one of them, to where they do a proof of stake instead of a proof of work. Meaning that as long as you are running the client and you have some of their coins, then you wind up getting some of the uh, forging fees, which is what they call it instead of a miner's fee. So what I would love to see is something to where people can run this client and it keeps the, you know, whatever we're going to call the replacement to the ISBN, it keeps that log running and people just, you know, like create an address and then s attach a book name to it. And then I don't want there to be any fees involved at all. So if somebody can figure out how to do that, then run with it. I, I'm claiming no ownership of the idea. Wow. Yeah, I really like that idea. Maybe it could be sort of like a decentralized Kindle type thing where you're opening a reader and the reader is actually forging with a proof of stake coin that somehow has a, a blockchainized record of the ISBN numbers or yeah. the equivalent. Yeah. I love it. Cool. Well, if anyone wants to get in touch with Daryl about that, his website, fpp.cc, you can contact him there. And uh, cool. I hope that happens. I would like to decentralize that process for sure. Uh, so... Josh and Zach, I wonder if you could maybe speak a little bit about some of the regulatory issues or hurdles that you've overcome. You've kind of taken a, a different route than perhaps the flagrant lawbreakers on this panel, uh, <laughs> the, the other panelists. You've kind of sort of gone, you know, tried to comply within reason and not completely destroy your business model, but, you know, get it out there in a way that most people can access. So what have been your most difficult challenges in that realm? Because I'm sure there are some. Um, so first of all, we're, we're just a uh, manufacturer of these machines. We don't actually operate any of them. Um, so th these uh, money transmitting laws um, don't apply directly to our business, but they... Did you adjust your business plan based on um, that? Yes, yeah, so we, we, were, we were careful about that, and mm -hmm. uh, that, that probably informed um, a lot of our decisions, um, the way we decided to go about the business. Um, but... At the same time, we want our operators in the United States and around the world to um, be able to deploy these machines without, uh, without worrying about things. And the, especially in the United States, the, uh, the money transmitting laws are, are incredibly draconian. The, the, uh, the penalties for even uh, small um, problems with your you know, money transmitting, licensing, and compliance um, could end up costing you uh, decades in jail, or at least that's what the prosecutors are seeking. Mm. Um, there have been a number of cases uh, in the Bitcoin community of prosecutors going after friends of ours um, and, and threatening people with 20, 30 years in jail. Wow. Um, so it's something that people have to be very careful about, especially if, you know, they're deploying a uh, public machine in a retail location. It's not something they can really um, hide or, or keep secret. Um, so, you know, um, one of the things we've been doing is, is looking at the, the FinCEN guidance and, and the problem with that is it keeps on shifting. It seems like they're, they're changing their minds of whether they want to um, take a step back from regulating everything Bitcoin or whether they want to kind of broaden it so that they're regulating more and more. Um, and in the last few days, they've, FinCEN has put out um, some new guidance, which looks like they're trying to, to regulate more, like they're trying to go beyond um, possibly what the original laws say and broaden those laws so that they apply to more people. Specifically, um, that could include people who operate a uh, Bitcoin machine. Um, so, like, if someone owns a restaurant and has a Lama Sioux machine in their restaurant, 
then they could potentially be labeled as a money transmitter. It's something? not really. It's not really um, a question of who owns the space, but of who is operating the machine. So Got it could it. be somebody coming in, you know, making an agreement with the restaurant owner to place a machine there. The restaurant owner wouldn't need to be licensed, but the the person operating the machine um, would have to be if that's considered a business that's a money transmitting business. Oh, so scary. Stephanie, I, I don't know who you're calling lawbreakers. I have an intergalactic bit license that <laughs> uh, authorizes the bearer of, of this card, uh, or rather it recognizes that the bearer of this card has a natural and inalienable right to financial freedom and privacy. This includes, but is not limited to, possession, transfer, transmission, uttering, passing, laundering, mining, hoarding, sending, receiving, and earning of Bitcoin. So I do have a license. Excellent, excellent. <laughs> no, I did not. Can, where, can people buy them? <laughs> Bitcoin, not bombs. <laughs> dot com. Cool. Um, yeah, so, I mean, Zach, maybe you could speak to this. Uh, I've just, I've noticed some of your competitors, like the competitors to Lamasu, because mm -hmm. you guys were the first uh, in your industry, but there have been lots of others competing. Um, including some kind of scary ones that uh, literally will take your handprint, will take a picture of That's you. That's RoboCoin. Um, yeah, there's others too. I mean, uh, they have these complicated instructions on how to create an account like hanging on the machine uh, that include, you know, we, we need everything from a DNA sample to, you know, to your picture, to your government issued ID and your passport. And I mean, it's, it's getting to a level that's really uh, crazy. And you guys have managed to, to pretty much avoid going there for the time being, right? Is, is that because you're only going from cash into Bitcoin and not the other way? Uh, and, and you're only making the hardware, as you said, uh, as uh, Josh said, and not actually operating it? Um, I, I don't think it's because, um, A, it's because it's one way. Um, or has there been like an ideological reason for, for not going there? That's what I'm really getting at. <laughs> well, there's, there's always an ideological reason for not wanting to go there. Mm -hmm. But then there's also the practical reason of how, of how do you get enough machines out there. And if you can't launch a machine in a certain area without some kind of compliance solution or people will go to jail, then uh, the operator of that machine is going to want to have some kind of compliance solution so he can operate the machine without uh, going to the to jail as to the best of his ability. Um, for one, I don't think that all of the I don't think that the compliance solution that some of our competitors are offering are necessary and I do think that they're very intrusive so even from a user ex you know even if I uh, if I believed in regulation it, it's intrusive and it's a bad user experience and uh, you know there's from any of the regulation that that I've seen or read there was no mention of a of a palm scanner or anything that would be recognized um, from a government level so I don't even think it's something that's necessary I think you know you have to look and see what what is the the what is necessary for the government to say um, okay this machine as far as I'm concerned you are now compliant you're doing what you have to um, and um, so for that you know we, we we just talk to our operators and we say well you know what jurisdiction are you in what do you need and especially at an earlier stage the US market was really small for us Part of the reason was regulation. They didn't even want to try to, you know, people were, were terrified of even touching it. Um, and so for, um, you know, some of the places we have in Europe, under 15,000 euros, you don't have to do anything. So that's basically, you know, it's not a priority for us right now. We don't yeah. have to start figuring out how to make our user experience more difficult and complicated if there's not demand from our operators. So at the first stage, you know, it makes obviously it makes using our machine a lot easier if you don't um, have extra steps. It's just three steps. You just go to the machine, you press start, scan your QR code, put in cash, press send, and go home. Um, and then compared to all these other processes where you know it takes uh, uh, you know 15 minutes to to be verified on the system, and then uh, by the time it gets sent to you from from Bitstamp and you know the transactions clear etc there were people that you know 24 hours later and they still haven't received their bitcoins so uh, I think there, there are two aspects to it one of it is just pure um, user experience the other part of what is required from us what are the priorities of our operators what do they need and as we started getting more US and uh, Canadian operators that say listen we're starting to get pressure and we can really only launch this if we have a compliance solution 
that's when we started looking into it, and that's when we started going to um, uh, a third-party service that provides a compliance service, and we just integrate it into our system in a really simple way. Um, that somebody just goes into the machine, it's one extra step, they scan in their driver's license, it makes sure they're not on any government list, and then it's, okay, you can do it. It's what not as intrusive. What list is it checking against? <laughs> What's that? What list is it checking against? Oh, all of, all I mean, all of your all favorite list. lists. <laughs> of course, we're all on some list, but yeah. I mean. <laughs> probably the terror watch list, if I had to guess. There, there are a few lists that, that probably none of us in the room are actually on. So I don't, th I don't think, you know, it's probably pretty rare that, uh, unless, you know, uh, you're on IS or something, the, the, the Islamic State, and they know about it, um, then you may be on one of those lists. But I don't think it would, it would, it's not the kind of thing that anybody in this room that I'd expect to be on one of those lists. All right. So uh, I have two more questions for the panel, and then I guess maybe we'll have some time to open it up for audience questions. Can you just put up your hand if you have a question you want to ask the panel? Okay. So we got a couple of questions. There's a mic that they could start lining up at. I yeah, guess. sure. Um, let's do that. So we've got like we've got about uh, 12 minutes left. So just uh, just real quick for Riaz and Josh and Zach, um, can you just describe what a Bitcoin meetup is like in New Hampshire? We've got the longest running Bitcoin meetup here in Manchester, New Hampshire. What could someone expect if they went to one of those? Like paint a picture. Uh, it's it's quite incredible coming from Florida and seeing this for the first time when I got here about a year ago and coming to my first Manchester Bitcoin meetup there on average there's maybe like 25 or 30 uh, different people there that are all engrossed in Bitcoin or enthralled in it in such a manner that can even be described um, and there, there's so much technical knowledge going around the room that um, it can be a little uh, convoluted and esoteric conversation for anyone sitting at tables around the area that are that are not with us. But it Is always uh, piques interest among people that are in the room that are not with our group or uh, people overhear things. And we have people coming up to us and and realizing that we're talking about Bitcoin. Um, Is there trading that goes on? Yeah, absolutely. There's never a, a case where you can come to one of the Bitcoin meetups in Manchester and not find someone who's willing to buy or sell you know, any amount up to a few hundred dollars worth of Bitcoin, probably, you know, there, and, and we're talking about at spot where there's no premium. It's, it's extremely easy to trade Bitcoin within our community. That's probably the, the one of the main shining uh, characteristics of, of the of, of the meetups is how liquid uh, the community is as far as Bitcoin transactions. It's a part of our lives that pretty much everyone that comes to the Bitcoin meetups or even the greater community in Manchester and the in the area uh, probably use Bitcoin a number of times every single day in their regular lives. Cool. So if you're in Manchester, New Hampshire, you people out there on the internet, I'm looking at you, uh, <laughs> you should uh, stop by the Bitcoin meetups in New Hampshire. They're usually at, uh, usually on Sunday nights. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. It's uh, every Sunday at uh, six or seven o'clock. Is it six o'clock? Six, six o'clock uh, in the evening, every Sunday night. It's never really changed. It's always at Strange Brew Tavern on Market Street in Manchester. There's All right. There's only one Manchester Bitcoin meetup. <laughs> All right. And then just a real quick for Brian and Daryl, either one of you who wants to take this. Uh, I know both of you are interested and have, have spoken before about altcoins or just alternative uses of blockchain technology. Um, what, if any of those, do you see as being having particular relevance for New Hampshire or for the Liberty community or for the Free State Project or anything like that? I don't know. I, I'll let... Brian actually answer the question, but uh, I have gone on record in the past as saying that Bitcoin is the Roman chariot of currencies. And what I mean by that is, you know, the Roman chariot was sort of the first real mode of transportation that people had. And it's not really being used a lot right now. Uh, and I foresee that, you know, in the future, I, I'm not going to project how far, but, you know, in the future, there's going to be something like Bitcoin that definitely is the standard mode of transportation. Bitcoin might still maybe exist in several hundred years. I don't really know. Uh, but I'll let Brian actually answer the question. Sure. Uh, I think uh, NXT is definitely one of them, which Daryl mentioned earlier, uh, is one of the more interesting ones, particularly because right now, right now, existing right now, is a free market exchange that the world has never seen. 
that we know of. You know, I mean, maybe in some pirate, you know, Libertatia in Madagascar or something that existed, but it's never existed at any other time. And uh, where you can literally, you know, I mean, trade goods and, and do all the financial stuff that you're used to doing in, in the, the world today. Uh, so I think that's a pretty interesting one. But the, really the more interesting one is I really think there should be an FSP coin. I think there should be a New Hampshire coin or whatever, Shire coin, whatever you want to call it. Uh, because I don't, I don't believe that there should be one currency, quite frankly. Uh, I think that specie, you know, uh, and, and like specialization is the key to a really great economy. And having a whole slew of coins uh, is a wonderful thing that can address the, spe you know, the specific needs of a specific area. Like in New Hampshire, you have the White Mountains. Okay, Bitcoin doesn't work in the White Mountains. There's no internet. You know, what are you going to do? And so, you know, coming up with coins and things of that nature are probably a lot easier than actually creating further infrastructure. Uh, and this is, you know, this is the libertarian dream where, oh, North Dakota has its own bank. Well, the Shire could have its own bank too, or not a bank, but they could have their own financial system if they want it with something like Shire coins. So I think that would be a really great, uh, a great innovation. And I think it would have genuine value because clearly there's people here in this audience. There's value here, you know, right there. So, uh, so I think that's, uh, that would be interesting. But otherwise, yeah, NXT would be, would be intriguing. Cool. All right. Let's open it up to questions from the audience. Let's have Matt. So yeah, uh, I listen to Free Talk Live uh, some of the time. And uh, you know, before that begins, I hear Daryl you know, list the, uh, that day's price for gold, silver, and Bitcoin. I notice that gold and silver haven't been doing very well lately. So what I'm wondering is uh, the stagnation that we've seen uh, throughout the majority of this calendar year uh, with the price of Bitcoin. Do you think that the, uh, that's due mostly or perhaps entirely to uh, a larger dynamic whereby uh, like the Federal Reserve is uh, doing their shenanigans and like suppressing the price of all alternative medium of media of exchange? I don't know. I, you know, it, it would be easy to say, yeah, the Fed, they're you know, suppressing blah, blah, blah. But maybe that's a conspiracy theory. Maybe it's conspiracy fact. I don't really know. But... It's one of those things to where there's so many different factors at play to where I don't think anybody really knows what it's going to do. I remember last year about this time when Bitcoin was hovering around $200 uh, you know, from like the time of Porkfest 2013 until late October of last year. It was around 100 then it started creeping up to 200, and then the next thing I know, it's 400, then 800, and then you know a thousand. And when it was like you know 1,100 dollars per Bitcoin is when I actually sold a car to Rob Mathias for Bitcoin in what is believed to be the first ever person-to-person -person vehicle transaction anywhere in the world. It's not the first time that anybody bought a car with Bitcoin because somebody did buy a car directly from Tesla with Bitcoin. Oh. Cool. All right. And uh, unfortunately, I don't think the mic was on for that last question from yeah, Matt, but no, it, we, we turned it on. Uh, but the question for the recording purposes, the question was basically, is there manipulation going on with the Bitcoin? Is it, is it no, uh, we, we don't have time. We'll, we'll go to Emmanuel. Yeah, just oh, we're, we're short on time. Phrase it, we, clarification. No, uh, where it's nothing with Bitcoin itself, where there's a larger trend of all alternative media of exchange in general being suppressed. So there's not, you know, no inherent flaw or, uh, you know, nothing with just Bitcoin. All right, cool. Let's, <coughs> let's go to Emmanuel. Okay, so my question is uh, more future projected. Uh, so we've had, like, maybe like a couple of weeks ago, the first Bitcoin marriage or black chain man blockchain marriage that actually didn't get recorded because blockchain or the uh bitcoin software had taken the notes all they they uh deactivated the ability to add a note to a transaction so that uh bitcoin marriage that was supposed to have happened never actually got recorded on the blockchain <laughs> okay <kind> of <laughs> okay so that's i know the part that's probably for the best <laughs> all right so my question is more uh in the future, I've heard of the Ether coin or whatever. So I was wondering what uh, other um, use of the blockchain you can see. Do you see like crypto vote, uh, voting or uh, crypto, uh, the blockchain being used uh, as for passport or international uh, ID for uh, or anything like that? Sure. Uh, there's a lot of that getting developed. Actually, Chris Ellis came up with like this cryptographically secured passport. Um, there's a lot of people talking about doing voting, uh, but in my opinion, all of these are terrible ideas. 
Uh, first off, putting X onto a blockchain does not, is not innovation. Okay, and if X isn't a good idea without a blockchain, that doesn't mean it's a good idea once it's put on a blockchain. Okay, <laughs> so yeah, and, and any of these government services or whatever that they want to do is, is just an atrocity waiting to happen. Uh, I'm not saying it's necessarily Skynet, but uh, like even voting, voting is a good one that a lot of people like to bring up because it's so easy to implement. Uh, but voting, the most powerful aspect of voting, and this is a particularly powerful one legally in New Hampshire, as I understand it, is the secret ballot. You're not going to have a secret ballot when there's cryptography that can get cracked at some point. It doesn't exist. There's always a, a, you know, a record of that, which you don't want. That's the whole point. It's the whole beauty of voting, quote unquote, if there is a beauty, is the secret ballot. Okay, and I'm not saying that there's a beauty to it. So, yeah, that, that's, that's my opinion on that. Uh, international ID, again, that's something that's being developed. Uh, I'm not a fan necessarily of passports because really any kind of ID system just too much reminds me of papers, please, papers, papers. You know, and, and even if it's voluntary, it may work if it's voluntary, but then the question becomes just like U.S. citizenship. Sure, your U.S. citizenship is voluntary too, but try leaving, you know, with your skin still anyway, and, and you're, you're in for uh, some trouble. So it depends on, the, the question becomes with like an ID system, uh, what, does it, what happens if I want to leave or revoke it? And if there are stipulations, I don't feel that that's freedom. So that's and for a lot more on that, you can uh, tune into Brian's podcast, Sovereign Tech, S-O-V-R-Y-N Tech, a weekly show where he discusses a lot of these issues in depth. And just maybe one quick last question from Aaron. All right. um, I know that in BitTorrent technology, I saw over time that the, that the uh, media industries kind of had to grow to compete. They couldn't directly use force against the users. They had to compete and make things easier and split things up. I see currency as something directly competing with government. Do you foresee a method in which the government may try and clamp down on you, though it's decentralized, or how will they They're compete? already trying to clamp down by instituting all of these weird, goofy, conflicting rules where FinCEN says that Bitcoin is money, the IRS says that Bitcoin is property, and the New York Department of Financial Services is trying to say that if anybody accepts Bitcoin and one of their customers may have driven through New York that one time, that you have to get name, date, serial number, you know, semen count and everything <laughs> else in order to be able to do business with. And you have to collect that for all of your customers everywhere in the world because that one guy drove through New York that one time. So you do have government agencies that are trying to prevent it. And what I think most of us up here are trying to do is find loopholes around what the government is trying to do. And I, I have actually gained some level of notoriety because as far as is known, I'm the first presidential candidate anywhere in the world to accept Bitcoin. And I actually wrote a letter to the FEC, which is the Federal Election Commission, saying this is the last letter, the first and the last letter that you will ever receive from me. I am not abiding by any of your laws. I think that all of your laws are bupkis, and I will be accepting Bitcoin and other alternative forms of currency. So I, I think that you know I can speak for at least Brian and Riaz in saying that we're trying to find ways around their regulations, and I don't really care what the regulations are. Now, what I want to know is, the, was the word bupkis really used in the letter? No. <laughs> All right. So I think we're out of time. Thank you so much for tuning in. If you want to hear more from me, you can go to letstalkbitcoin.com. Subscribe to the podcast. It comes out twice a week. Daryl is at fpp.cc. fpp.cc. The audio is fppradio.com. And I actually have to go jump in the Nada bus, drive to the LRN studio, and I've got a show in like half an hour. Thank you for being here, Daryl. Brian's at Sovereign Tech, S-O-V-R-Y-N Tech dot com. Riaz, do you have anything? Find you at the Manchester Bitcoin meetups? <laughs> you have a website or anything? Um, you can find me on Facebook under Agora Cab. Agora Did you Cab. register Agora.cab yet? <laughs> I might be changing the name of the, the project eventually. I'm not sure. Oh, exciting things to come. And uh, Josh and Zach, Lamasu uh, Bitcoin Machine, where's your website? Yeah, lamasu.is. So that's uh, L A M A S S U dot I S. I S is for Iceland, by the way. It's, Iceland. It's not I S. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, I don't have to change it in the future. I don't think they've gotten uh, UN. Uh, <laughs> <laughs>
All right. Recognition the, yet. <laughs> and the Lama Su, the Sumerian beast of liberty. <laughs> Th <laughs> thank you guys so much. Let's have a big round of applause for our panelists. Thank you so much for being here. <laughs> We'd like to invite you to visit Freekeen.com. Freekeen.com features audio, video, and blogs chronicling the transition to a voluntary society. Freekeen.com also has comments and discussion forums so you can be heard. Freekeen.com. I should be in Keene, New Hampshire with the Free Staters. <laughs>